Welcome to this Advanced Intelligent Resilient Framework, or IRF, video. This video is part of a series of videos discussing Advanced IRF and are available on the HP website. In this video, we are discussing and demonstrating the extension of an IRF system. At the moment, we have two IRF members. This will now be extended by adding a third IRF member, and that's what will be demonstrated in this video. In the next video that's part of the series, we'll extend that further by adding a fourth IRF member. But in this video, we're going to look at how to add a third IRF member, in this case, IRF member three, to an existing IRF system that consists of two IRF members. We'll do this without shutting down or rebooting the IRF system. So the current IRF system consisting of these two switches will stay up while we add a third member to the IRF system. Now videos in this series use the HP simulator as much as possible. Using the HP simulator allows us to demonstrate IRF technologies quickly, as well as allowing you to download the HP simulator and practice the configuration yourself. Now this depends on what you're using to view the videos, but as an example, if you're viewing this via a brain shock, you will find the HP simulator configuration attached to the attachments tab of this presentation. So download the HP simulator, which is available for free from the HP website, use the attached topology, and then you can follow along by doing this yourself. This is the IRF HP simulator setup, which consists of four core IRF switches, as well as two access IRF switches and a mad assist IRF switch. In the HP simulator setup video, which is part of the series, we explain how to download, configure and set up this environment so that you can test and experiment with the HP IRF technology. Currently, the two switches, switch one or unit one and unit two that are part of the IRF system are connected using 10 gigabit 108 and 10 gigabit 207. This is member one and this is member two. So this interface has been renumbered as 207. When we extend the IRF system, we're using port eight to connect to port seven on unit three. So this will be interface 208, and we will now renumber this new switch as member three, so the interface will become 10 gigabit 307. As explained in a subsequent video, we'll extend the topology further by adding a fourth switch and configuring these switches in a ring topology. That means that if this link goes down as an example, the IRF system is still connected and is not split. So this provides more redundancy. This video is a continuation of the previous video that's part of the series, where we created a IRF system with two units or devices in the IRF system. We can review the existing configuration by using the display IRF command. And in the output, you can see that we have two members, member one and member two, or unit one and unit two, Member one is the master, member two is the standby device in the IRF system. So the IRF system is currently up and running with two devices as part of the system. So currently, unit one and unit two have a single connection, and now we're going to extend the IRF system. Units one and two are currently running and were used in previous videos. So let's start with unit three. We'll power on unit three, and then we'll configure the unit via the console port rather than using the auxiliary port, which we did in previous videos. So through the console, we need to press Control D to stop the automatic configuration of the device, and we'll press Enter to get started. When adding a new device, we'll need to verify or change the IRF member ID, which is typically one. We'll need to assign a device priority, and in this case, we'd make it lower than the current priorities, we need to shut down the 10 gigabit ports. We need to assign the 10 gigabit port to the logical IRF port and then unshut the 10 gigabit port, save the configuration and then activate the pending configuration. We would do this for each new device that we're adding to the IRF system. 
The display IRF command shows us that this unit has a member ID of one. That is the default configuration. So we'll go to system view and then we'll change the member ID from one to three. We'll need to save the configuration and then reboot the system. In this example, we saved the configuration before rebooting. That's not strictly required. It was simply done to stop the switch trying to get an automatic configuration after reload. So once the switch is rebooted, we can use the display IRF command to view IRF information. And in this example, you can see that the member ID has changed to three as expected. We can use the command display interface 10 gigabit brief to view the 10 gigabit interfaces. And in this example, you can see that the interfaces start with three. So three slash zero slash five up to three slash zero slash eight. Once again, a factory shipped switch would have interface numbers starting with one because the member ID is one. But in this case, because we renumbered the member ID to three and rebooted the switch, the interface numbers start with three. Once again, in our topology, unit one is connected via 10 gigabit 108 to 10 gigabit 107 on unit two. And unit two is connected via 10 gigabit 108 to unit three on 10 gigabit 107. The first thing we'll do is change the priority and use the command IRF member three priority 28 to change the default priority of one. So this value is higher than the default of one but lower than the priorities of the existing devices in the IRF system. So as a reminder, display IRF shows us that member one has a priority of 32 and member two or unit two has a priority of 30. We can now configure unit three's 10 gigabit interface to be part of the logical IRF port. To do that, we firstly need to shut the interface down. So interface 10 gigabit 307 shut down. We can now go to the IRF logical port. So IRF port three, three because this is unit three. We need to use a different port number to the logical IRF interface that this interface is connecting to. Display IRF configuration shows us our IRF ports. And on both IRF member one and member two, the 10 gigabit interface, eight, is associated with IRF port one and 10 gigabit interface seven is associated with IRF port two. So on unit three, we need to associate this port with IRF port two. So in the IRF logical port, we'll use the port group interface command to bind the physical interface 10 gigabit 307 to the logical IRF port. The next step is to enable the physical port. We'll save the configuration and then activate the IRF port configuration. This member or unit is now ready to join the IRF system. On the existing IRF system, we don't need to connect or access unit two because all the configuration has been done on the master. So even if you physically connected to the console of unit two, the commands you type are interpreted by the master device. So in this case, we've connected to the console of unit one. So now on the core IRF system, we'll configure unit two, port one, to connect to unit three. This is physically using 10 gigabit 208, which is connected to 10 gigabit 307 on unit three. So firstly, a review of the interfaces, display interface 10 gigabit brief. We can see that 10 gigabit 208 is administratively down at the moment. This is once again the physical interface that's connected to unit three. So the first thing we need to do is shut the 10 gigabit interface down. This has already been done because in a similar environment, interfaces are by default administratively down. The next step is to configure the logical IRF port. So in this example, it's IRF port two because we're configuring member two slash one because we're configuring IRF port one. So member two slash port one. That interface is not currently configured. So IRF port two slash one port group interface 10 gigabit 
208 allows us to bind the physical interface to this logical IRF port. We now need to go to interface 10 gigabit 208 and undo shut the interface, in other words, enable it. As you can see in the output on device three, the physical interface came up. So we see 10 gigabit 307 changed to up. At the moment, however, IRF is not performing a merge operation because the IRF changes on the IRF system are still in the pending state. So IRF is already active on the ports previously configured, but any new changes which we've done to the IRF configuration have to be reactivated. We can now activate the IRF port configuration, and in this case, we are actually committing the changes that we've done. When we run that command, we'll see a new master election taking place because the existing master has a priority of 32 and the new device has a priority of 28. That means the new device added to the IRF system will lose the election and it will reboot. So pressing enter on the IRF port configuration active command, you can see that unit three has now rebooted. So the new port configuration is now active. Device three is rebooting. And during the reboot process, it'll find an existing master and so it'll join the IRF system. Because we previously configured the line class auxiliary commands on the IRF system on the existing master, it means that this new device will have auxiliary port two allocated and will automatically be reachable using the auxiliary port connection. First step is to check that the device joins successfully. So we can use the command display IRF to do that. In the output, we can see that an additional device has joined the IRF system. It has member three, it's in the standby role and has a priority of 28. To ensure that all configurations are saved on all the devices, we'll use the command save safely force and as you can see in the output, the current configuration was saved to the main board. It was saved to slot two CPU zero and slot three CPU zero. What this does is ensures that the startup configuration includes the interface configuration of all the members of the IRF system, including the new member. In addition, we can test the console access to unit three in some way, as previously discussed, we can use the pipe command. We are now connected to the auxiliary port of device three. And as you can see, we now have access to device three in addition to the other devices. As you can see in the output, we have full writes via the auxiliary port. Please view the previous videos in the series to review the discussion about auxiliary ports and somewhere. So that concludes this demonstration of adding an additional device to an IRF system. That concludes this video discussing advanced IRF. This video is only one of a series of videos discussing advanced IRF configurations. Please look on the HP website for additional videos to help you configure and troubleshoot HP IRF. Thank you for watching.